Good morning, all. Uh, you're welcome. Welcome to the breakfast briefing for Scottish Engineering. We've got a few people just coming into the waiting room just now, so I'll just wait maybe another 30 seconds just to allow them in, and then we can kick off. Thanks very much. I think that's us now. So, as I said earlier on, welcome to the Scottish Engineering Breakfast Briefing for October. Uh, my name's Kevin Duffy, I'm one of the solicitors in the legal and HR team here in Scottish Engineering. And today we have presenters from Mac OH, an occupational health partner who works a lot with Scottish Engineering. The two presenters are Professor Ewan MacDonald, OBE, one of the foremost occupational physicians globally, who combines high level of experience internationally and nationally and also one of the other directors of MacOH, uh, Lynn Keogh, under the pseudonym Jack Keogh today. And she's got 25 years experience in the healthcare sector as well. Today, the topic is COVID-19 and long COVID, what it is and impact on workability. So without further ado, I can hand over to Lynn. Thanks very much. Hey, good, good morning. Um, I see a few of our, our customers actually are out there in the audience today. So hello to everybody. Uh, we're, we're delighted to be asked along today to talk about what's going on with COVID or what we see from our perspective. We're a small occupational health company and as much as we call ourselves a boutique company, uh, we have been on the go now for, uh, this is our sixth year. So we've had an exciting time over the last uh, couple of years with COVID and what uh, the impact has been in our clients and customers. It's been a hard go for everybody. And apart from all the normal stuff that goes on in the business, uh, there's, we're seeing an awful lot of mental health issues coming up and aging workforces. And Ewan's going to talk a bit about where we are at the moment, a kind of stab as to where we are just now, uh, as far as COVID is concerned and its impact in our business. So uh, without anything else to do, I was told not to to say too many good things about you and I could start now and talk for ages, but I'm not going to say. I'll leave it up to, to you to, to know him. Uh, and I'll hand over to you now to give us a, a review of, of where we see us uh, at this time. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning and <clears throat> thanks for um, the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to talk, um, start, I'm basing my talk on COVID. <clears throat> And an update on where we are with that, but I'll also touch on the other more general issues. And at the end, I'll go quite quickly. Uh, and at the end, I'll be um, uh, happy to take any questions on any of the, the broader topics. So um, if I can just get this up. Yep. And um, okay. can everyone see that? <coughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I am um, advise EU OSHA um, it, because they approached us <clears throat> and they asked me to open a conference that they were doing across Europe last week, and this is this is just an over an overview of that. Um, uh, interesting enough, with 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 COVID, it's probably an occupational disease. It's probably occupationally acquired. It was an experimental laboratory where they experiment with viruses. They also have a military part of it. A laboratory, they're known to have slightly poor safety standards, laboratory safety standards. And a laboratory worker got infected and hey presto, we see the result. And um, so if you like, this has been a failure of health and safety, <clears throat> of HR, of control systems. But of course, this is my interpretation I'm sure that would be denied strenuously by lots of other scientists, including China. But that there's a lot of it. It could have well be a, a an occupational thing, an occupational problem that's caused this whole pandemic, but on an, ex, an experimental virus. So, what's the situation? <clears throat> there's been 229 million cases, for a, a recorded 4,700,000 deaths across the the globe, about 
billion vaccines have been given. The deaths are an underestimate because it depends on how well they're recorded in countries which don't have good recording systems. <clears throat> in the EU, <clears throat> Um, there's about um, been 68 million cases. Um, long COVID is an issue which is affecting employers. Uh, uh, up, it estim estimates in the UK of up to a million people have had long COVID. That is symptoms lasting more than 12 weeks. Most people um, uh, recover from COVID. Uh, we know about the vulnerability of pre-existing conditions. Vaccines, uh, vaccine successful vaccine program has made a huge difference. So. People, <clears throat> people are are um, uh, not less likely to die if they catch if they're vaccinated if they catch the I get serious illness if they catch COVID. Um, quite a lot of the people who are in hospital are people who have been anti-vaxxers, don't believe in it, and uh, sadly some of these are dying. So a study of 20,000 cases showed that 13% of symptoms over 12 weeks. So therefore, in terms of illness, return to work, um, uh, the, 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 the long-term, uh, it can be quite long-term absence. The majority, there's a female dominance in that. It's the, the highest prevalence is in the, we're in the middle of the working age population. So it's a, a condition which affects working age people. Um, <clears throat> So, um, and here's an example of uh, uh, somebody I saw early in the, relatively early, um, a night support worker, very fit and active, unusually, uh, doing well camping with her family and things like that. Got COVID March 20, invented ITU for three weeks, came out of that extremely fatigued. She had vocal cord paralysis, i.e. she could hardly breathe, she breathless, lung scarring, and she could walk 200 meters with a stick in 15 minutes the first time I saw her. She was getting all those various therapies to help. Um, the reality is if you've got the lung scarring and you've got the changes, there's no sort of magic bullet to sort these. Um, so it's about rehabilitation. Adaptations to home. Um, when I reviewed her in the beginning of uh, this year, she could walk five, 400 meters slowly, quite unfit for work. There's also, there's also, um, um, so this is Dave, a friend of mine, who is very keen to tell everybody what his business is. Um, he is a, a consented to, both have consented to this. 48, he runs a boat business, boat transport, very fit, ex martial arts. His partner returned from holiday, from a holiday to Wuhan in November 2019 with a cold. He became unwell and got a chest infection. And I was seeing him sort of semi socially, um, and not work, not my occupational health sense. And advised him to see his GP because he was coughing and spluttering and breathless at home. But you know, being a tough guy, no, no, he wasn't going to see his GP. He hadn't seen a GP for 10 years, wasn't sure who it was. In January, he still had residual breathlessness and exercise, and he was having chest pains. Um, <clears throat> he's still working. He estimated his exercise tolerance as 40% of normal. In February 2020, so he saw his family doctor eventually, referred for investigation. He had lung scarring and he had had a heart attack. He's still got a reduced exercise tolerance, though he's improving. And his exercise tolerance since early September, he said, was about 60% of what it used to be. So COVID can be a very nasty condition, but fortunately for most of us, it's not. Um, but it still can leave people with significant symptoms. And I'll talk about these. So this is just one of the pretty pictures that shows when people are ill, these are the kind of symptoms they get. Fatigue being the most dominant, breathlessness, they lose taste, sense of taste and smell. Uh, and there's a whole lot of conditions I'll talk about. And when you follow up afterwards, fatigue and breathlessness are still the major, the major symptoms. And for many people, 90% will have some fatigue for about 80 days. <clears throat> it can be severe, they can get a bit better and then it fluctuates. So they can, they can complain of breathlessness up to 40% after 60 days, up to 20% might have some myo my myocarditis. Now my cardiological colleagues tell me that this is an exacerbation of pre-existing problems, but the point is the viruses, it does exacerbate problems. They can have postural hypertension, that is when you suddenly stand up, your, your blood vessels don't adapt and you can fall down and a faint or you feel dizzy. And there's quite a lot of people having mild cognitive effect and 
as well as mental health issues. Mental health issues are much wider than COVID, of course, but the cognitive effect or brain fog is what people complain about. It's, it's an issue in people who are high performing workers or safety critical workers. So these are the kind of symptoms. This was produced by one of the long COVID patient groups, 45,000, produced the kind of symptoms that they experience. <clears throat> and it can affect any part of the body. It's a neurotropic virus, I'll go into the elusive smell and taste because it goes into the nervous system. And it's an inflammatory problem, which probably is an inflammation of blood vessels, and therefore it can inflame blood vessels anywhere. So these are the kind of common symptoms, and I'll leave that with you. You can look at it at your leisure. Um, the, <clears throat> the conditions, the kind of conditions that um, uh, are caused, and these are some of them. Um, this is not to frighten people. This is just the range of problems that people can get. So because of that, med the medical profession wasn't very good at recognizing what was going on. Because as you know, if you've got a cardiac problem, you go and see a cardiologist. If you've got a respiratory problem, you go and see a chest doctor. If you've got a urological problem, you see a renal doctor and that's all they do. And there's not so many people taking a holistic view of the whole person. So, so, so this led to problems with recognition. What is it? Is it a real phenomenon or is it just a version of ME? Um, it can be similar to ME, but there can also be that evidence of uh, subtle organ damage. So common symptoms are these, extreme tiredness, breathlessness, brain fog I've mentioned, dizziness, pins and needles, joint pain, depression and anxiety. There's a post ITU syndrome. If you're in ITU in a ventilator for three or four weeks, when you come out, you're very traumatized. And so there are all psychological effects then. Um, but apart from that, there's a, uh, it's causing um, anxiety and depression in, as well as all the other environmental and work-related issues that we have at the moment. Even skin rashes can occur. So it's a multi-system disease, um, primarily a disease of blood vessels. This is my interpretation of it, endotheliitis. Quite a lot of people like Dave may lack a diagnosis of COVID-19. They've never actually been, been to a doctor. They just got on with it. So they may, they may not be diagnosed. It wasn't recognized very well initially by uh, my, some of my colleagues because of the fact they work in, in specific sectors rather than generally. They've often had inadequate medical care because the NHS has been under huge stress and the focus has been on the really critically ill. But you don't have to have been critically ill to get long COVID. There's a lack of good rehabilitation facilities, which is a problem for all of every day in this, in, this, in, this, in this meeting because people are not adequately rehabilitated in relation to work. The NHS doesn't think about work um, because they're too busy. And so they end up getting referred, being, being flagged by HR or their manager or being referred to occupational health or to, uh, or to private disability. Service specialists and a lot of the OH clinics have been full of people with these sort of complaints. You know, memorably, some people complaining of brain fog, headaches, dizziness, neuralgia, um, and uh, musculoskeletal problems. And I've already talked about the bunkers of modern medicine, and much of the healthcare is the same. If you've got a chest problem, you'll get respiratory rehab. But actually, we need multidisciplinary by not demedicalized case managed rehabilitation and VOC rehab. And that's, a, that's something which really works with long-term people with long-term chronic problems. And it's not always available, but it's services are starting to be developed by the NHS recognizing that. One of the problems with the NHS, it, it doesn't know how to relies with the workplace. You know, they, only 50% of the population possibly have access to occupational health in the UK. In fact, a recent study said it was between 30 and 34 percent. Um, so, and it's not provided by the NHS unless it's for NHS staff. And so there's poor lies into the workplace. Most people gradually improve, fortunately. And the evidence is that most people do get back to work. The, pro the problem for us all, for, uh, for all of us here in this meeting is that they're often young skilled workers, they want to get back, they're traumatized by being, suddenly being ill. They've not often used to been not had the adequate rehabilitation. Um, they may have a cognitive effect. They need careful assessment, but actually most of what they need is not more 
go and see more specialists. It's, but it's get them back to work, the rehabilitation of work. And I've already talked about biopsychosocial case management, which is a lecture in its own right. You need a slow phase to turn, much slower than usual. You know, you, those of you who use occupational health, often people will say, well, it needs a phase return over three or four weeks. That's evidence-based. That actually speeds the return to work. And for these people, it often has to be much slower and sometimes alternative work. So they get back to work, but they may not be working, they may be still working part-time, you know, several months after their illness. The prognosis, however, is of improvement. So this point of a slow phase return to work, the normal triggers which employers and HR will, will customarily use don't really properly apply. Uh, quite a few lot of people are, including doctors I know, have been ill health retired already, which I think was far too fast. And uh, making sure they don't do more than 70% of what they feel they can do is one of the ways to stop them having hiccups and return. So it's a, long, it's a significant problem and poorly understood. It's a major impact in the workforce and economy. You know, another potentially million people going out of work in the UK is catastrophic for the economy. That's not happening, of course, but it's a big challenge. So, I've read, so you also need to consider them, and people have difficulty understanding it because it's new. It's a new disease, a multi-system disease. And, and for, you have to consider people's uh, the brain fog tends to improve, but you could consider safety critical issues if someone's a pilot, for example, or doing anything which is safety critical. So is it an occupational thing? Can it be acquired at work? At best, I guess most of you would say yes, um, thinking of hospital workers and things like that. This is a study I was personally involved in, looking at 120,000 people in the biobank, and there's a two, two file, two-fold increased risk for health workers and a sevenfold increased risk for medical support workers. That's the low pe people staff in the ward are going around cleaning up ITUs and things like that. And in a recent study, study I've done with the IOM, we're looking at sampled virus and air and, and surface and COVID area. The COVID area is not ICU in hospitals. Over 15% of all samples were positive. You've really got to be careful with surfaces about COVID. Never tends to forget about washing the hands and, and, and the gel. But, uh, masks are very important, but certainly if you touch something, clean your hands. In the UK, it's not compensatable yet, but it's been, cons it's been considered by the committee that reviews that. So the occupational, uh, occupational health risk assessment is, is always based in the workplace risk assessment. What are the workplace risks? What are their vulnerability? That's the overall occupational health risk assessment. What are the health promotion things you need? Often people, a lot of people have put on weight. Most people have put on weight with working at home and through COVID. That'll probably kill more people in Britain than COVID itself. The long-term effects of that half, half a stone weight gain. Um, so the advice about, about their health is, is one of the things we, we have to do. And it's important to discuss their concerns and ideas and expectations. And that informs our return to work advice in liaison with the employers. So the process, this is something, just, this, is a, this, is a, this is old stuff, but it's, it's very pertinent. One of the problems we've got in the UK now is aging workers. And we're an aging population. There's a shortage of labor as has become very apparent recently. And the question is uh, right across the world is how do you maintain, help people who are aging with good skills to be able to continue to work. Because the problem is, the time you're in your 50s or 55s, 55, you know, at least half of the population will have one or two medical conditions. The time the, the worker is 65, they've probably got about five medical conditions. And by the time you die, you might have about nine medical conditions. It's just part of aging. But the issue is, how do we keep help people to function? And this, is, this model is, is, is talks about it. So it's about, first of all, you know, our physical and mental capacity today is not as good as it was probably ten, five or 10 years ago. So it's about how we, what do we do in the workplace to maintain people's, you know, here's the health improvement, well-being stuff, their physical activity, making sure they're mentally in good shape and being aware of their social functioning and problems at home. As workers age, it's absolutely important to reskill them. There's a huge emphasis on 
giving young workers apprenticeships, but old workers need apprenticeships too, because they need to learn new skills, because of the, the way things are changing in the industry, in engineering, in, in chemical factories, all those things we look after, uh, and IT, in the IT environment, need, everyone needs new skills and knowledge. I personally have to do a do 100 hours of CPD every year, and I have to do that to maintain my registration. And every worker should be having systematic skill development every year. The, or, the psychosocial organization of work, which is more the HR thing and management thing, is it, it's about values and attitudes, ensuring people have got work satisfaction and are well motivated. If people are motivated, they'll continue working until they're 70 if they're able. Um, and then it's also about making sure the mental demands and physical demands and the work environment and the work community is looked after so that it's in a place where people want to work or, or want to be associated with. And all of that is how you, you improve workability. So that's the, that was a BMG editorial I wrote. Um, uh, so that concludes this bit of the, the, the presentation. What I'd like to do um, in the remaining 10 minutes is, <clears throat> Kevin wants to orchestrate that, is answer any questions about this, anything, anything else you want to raise, you would like to raise, anything, that's, uh, anything I've raised or anything else I haven't touched on, you would like some advice about. I'll try and answer. Okay, go, good morning, folks, again. Uh, you can either uh, put some questions in the chat, either anonymous with myself or to, for viewing for everybody or happy to allow you to speak verbally to you and just now. So folks, it's over to yourself. Yeah, my name is Mike Casey. I work in uh, health and social care. I just uh, wondered, the, the question of va vaccination status of staff has mm -hmm. been a bit of a hot topic um, and, and a couple of organisations I'm involved in. And yeah. what, what we've got some staff who've chosen not to get vaccinated and then we've got recruitment issues where you're, there's pressure on recruitment, but also the person saying, I'm not getting vaccinated. Yeah. Have you got any sort of comments or thoughts around those areas? Well, um, well, personally, I'll take any vaccine that's going, because vaccine is, 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 is vaccinations have transformed the health of the, the human race <clears throat> since they were, in, they were introduced <clears throat> by Jenner, by Jenner giving... Um, milkmaids, some of the cowpox uh, uh, in their skin, and that stopped them getting sm disfiguring smallpox. So, uh, and that's a long time ago. So, so I'm desperately waiting for my booster uh, and uh, my flu jab, and then I'll feel a bit, a bit better about it. So vaccinations are a good thing. In the NHS, um, in the NHS, all, all clinicians have, have mandatorily got to have a hepatitis B uh, immunization. And, uh, and are expected to be fully vaccinated, or else they can't do certain jobs. Surgeons are expected to be to have, you know, not to be able to be, to be vaccinated, so they don't carry diseases which would infect patients. So it's very difficult. I mean, I think it's it's a political and it's a it's a political as well as a moral and ethical issue. My view is, if my relative was going into a care home, I would want I would want the people looking after them to be vaccinated because they're much less likely to transmit disease. Um, <clears throat> so, so I think it's a social decision, really. Um, the anti-vaxxing, I believe it's caused a lot of fatalities in young people and, uh, and people are entitled to say, no one can compulsorily be vaccinated. You can't compulsorily make it. But I think we're in a, they're in a difficult position, the workers that want to still work with vulnerable people, but are vulnerable themselves and could be infecting themselves. If one way to round it would probably be to do lateral flow tests, you know, two or three times a week and regular COVID PCR tests for these workers so that if they if they become unwell, it's picked up very early. That could be one strategy to deal with it. I hope that's helpful. Mm. Okay, I've got another couple of questions on the chat. <clears throat> one of them is, at what point of a long-term illness does someone's ability to return to work become unworkable for a company? Well, I mean, I spent a lot of my life dealing with things like that. Um, and it varies from, and I've worked in a huge number of industries, and, and 
as you know, as you'll all know, policies vary from sector to sector and company to company. Uh, that's so, but generally, <clears throat> generally, it really depends on the tolerance of the organization. I mean, um, some, some, some organizations have a very short fuse and will, will um, dismiss people very early. I think that's very, very foolish now because the, the, the get, attract, getting workers is difficult. So, and some, some will, if it's public sector, of course, six months full pay, six months half pay, uh, which is a luxury, which the, the, the people that are generating the, the, the profits to pay for the NHS don't have generally. Um, so it really depends on company policies. I think in the context of aging workers, we have to, the key thing is to be proactive about them. So they're actually almost trying to get some interventions in the working population before they go off, before they go off. And the other, th the other thing is about this is that if people go off work, if, it's, if they're left to lie around for four weeks or five weeks or so, they become even more medicalized and their morale changes, they become depressed and actually it's harder to get them back to work. So it's really important, the early intervention, I've done some research which, showed the day one intervention. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about a supportive intervention. How are you? What's doing? What can we do for you? Uh, significantly reduces sickness absence. So the earlier there's contact with the employee, the better. To answer the question, it's up to the company, up to the company. But I would say with COVID in particular, you have to have, you often have to adapt the triggers and the policies. They're going to get better. They are often young and they're often key workers. They're going to get better. And, uh, uh, and it's better probably to hang on to them and just try and, 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 and keep them going. So, uh, you know, it can be up to about nine months with COVID that people get, get back to normal. They might not get back to normal. They might get back to reduced work, reduced work or alternative work. So I can't prescribe how long it should be. Um, with good treatment, so people with multiple morbidity um, uh, get better and can be helped to continue function. The problem with the NHS is now you've got four or five million people in the waiting list. They're years behind with cancer. It's quite hard to see, to hard to get access to, to, to the NHS. The NHS has is, is, uh, been struggling and people are finding it difficult to access healthcare. Uh, and we're, we're all going to have to deal with that. And so employers have to, employers will uh, um, need to think about how they deal with it. One of the companies that we look after, um, which is a factory type company, chemical plant, process workers, they, the, the benefits for their employers, for their employees include access to a virtual GP service, you know, privately funded. And if there's anything needing done, private referral for fast treatment because they, they have worked in the sums and worked out there's no way you can have people off for, for months waiting for something to be done, which is, you know, a technical thing which can be fixed quite early. So, so employers are going to have to start thinking more proactively about what you're all doing to contribute to keeping people at work. Not suggesting you'll provide private health care, but we're facing this challenge of an NHS, which is, which is, 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 is struggling at the best of times and is really under pressure now. And that will have an impact, it's having an impact on people with chronic health issues or acute health issues, but they're not ill enough to be in hospital and in an intensive care unit to get attention and get them back to work. Okay, Ewan, thank you. Second question is, how should employers manage the fact that people with long COVID may be okay one day, but not well enough to work sporadically? Yeah, I know, I know, and that's and that's a real pain because it's counterintuitive. You expect them to, if they're getting back to work, then next week they'll be better and they'll be a bit better and they'll progress. And you get this fluctuating course, and part of that's because of the inflammatory model, where it can come and go a bit. Gradually, they get better. Gradually, the vast majority are improving and are returning to work. I was talking to one of my colleagues in a in a, um, in a, a, a colleagues in. I, I chair a network of colleagues uh, running running big OH companies, and and generally they're finding they are getting back to work, but it's slow, and it can fluctuate. 
So it's just that I would suggest you need to tolerate the fluctuation. Of course, you can't tolerate things indefinitely, and that gets back to policy. But but um, these these individuals, they're going to have their bad days, um, and and um, but generally they'll get they'll get back to work. But they need more support, so there needs to be flexibility in how they're dealt with. I would suggest, which is difficult if you get set triggers and policies. Yep, that's all the questions in the chat just now, unless anyone else wants to put one in uh, in the chat just now. Other than that, any other verbal questions from the participants today? If not, I'll thank our speakers today, Ewan and Lynn. Thank you very much for giving us a very enlightening talk today on long COVID. The next breakfast briefing from Scottish Engineering will be on the first Wednesday of November, Wednesday the 3rd, and that will be presented by me on the subject of TUPE, the Transfer of Undertaking and Protection of Employment Regulations, which is a fascinating topic and I'll not, not be as in any way as engaging as uh, Professor McDonald as June was today, most certainly. So last call for many questions. If not, I'll bid everyone good morning. Thank you very if much. There's, if, there's a, if there's any Follow-up questions sure. people think you wish you'd asked, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Um, yeah, through, through you, Kevin, um, happy to, to deal with any, any queries that people want to. I'll try, I'll yeah. have to try and answer questions if anyone's got anything. Yeah, oh, sometimes, sometimes after the, the chat, it can be to remember questions, so we're quite happy to take them later if that helps. That's right. I'll send out a copy of uh, a link uh, to the recording of this along with the slides as well. So you'll have the contact details for the presenters as well, folks. Again, last call. If not, good morning. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Cheers. everybody. Thank you, Kevin. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye.